Growing up in Philadelphia, I always had an opportunity to visit a lot of the museums and the art galleries, and I just fell in love with African-American art, African-American history. And I decided to take a five-year sabbatical and kind of hang out down south and start collecting African-American memorabilia. So I had gone into an antique store in North Carolina. I asked a clerk, did they have anything that was African-American or black? And she says, they had one thing, but it was in the back room. The boss didn't want to put it out. So I says, miss, I have cash money. I'll buy whatever you have. She brought out this book about Little Black Sambo, and that was the beginning of my collection of African-American memorabilia. I was buying these things from my personal collection, and I didn't have to share them with anyone except my friends. And they would come to the house and say, this place is like a museum. And that planted a seed in my head that perhaps one day that we could do a museum. Stereotypes and your mama. Cream of wheat. A little black sambo. These are things that were perpetrated on African Americans. Growing up, they would go and they would see these products in the store and they would shop for them, but 90% of my grandparents and your grandparents probably made these things from scratch. This is called store-bought products, right? Cast iron banks, they were very, very collectible. They were made back in Europe in the late 1700s. You're gonna put the coin here in his hand. Lie it flat, push the button, you ready? A lot of times it's stereotype merchandise. When they traveled to Florida or traveled around the country, they would actually bring these back as gifts for the maids. I was sitting in a museum in Newtonville one day about 15 years ago, and one of the clerks said to me, this gentleman out front wants to see you. And this sucker comes in here with Ku Klux Klan material. Then later on, a guy comes here and he said to me, I was a policeman up in North Jersey and we raided a house. I found this clan robe in there. So now we're celebrating our 20th anniversary in Newtonville at the Dr. Martin Luther King Center. It's pretty amazing. And we've been at this location here in Atlantic City now for eight years. We have people from all over the country. Sometimes they don't want to go to the casino for the entire day. They like to mix it up with something. I had an opportunity to come down here while I was in high school with one of my classmates. I asked my parents could I come down and spend the weekend with them. They had no idea that this was like a, a town of sin. <laughs> and um, I went buck wild. I got off the bus and I saw people who looked like me that were in the police department. I saw hundreds of businesses, hotels and restaurants. They were owned and operated by people who looked like me. It was just a, a mecca of blacks doing outstanding things. And I was fascinated with it. Atlantic City, like no other city in the country, was the most segregated town on the East Coast. The African-Americans could only buy or rent a house in a certain section, and that was called the North Side. That's where some 30,000 people of color lived and worked out of. So that's part of the mission statement, is to be able to tell the true story and the history of Atlantic City. North Side, Nelson Johnson. He wrote the book, Boardwalk Empire, and he also wrote another book called The North Side. The book tells the story of the beginning of Atlantic City, how the African-Americans who came here were not uh, slackers whatsoever. It was part of the great migration to uh, the North. They came to Atlantic City in particular simply because they had an opportunity to go into the hospitality. They had their own businesses and they had created their own churches, everything you could imagine that was needed. So people came by the tens of thousands every weekend to come to Atlantic City to see our great entertainment industry. All the great entertainers from around the world came here as part of the chilling circuit. They weren't permitted to play at the big hotels on the boardwalk, but they were able to play at the Club Harlem. There would be no Atlantic City if there wasn't for the world famous Club Harlem. One of the first cottages and hotels that opened on the north side was called Wright's Hotel. They were located on Arctic Avenue. This gentleman here, uh, Clifford Newsom, he had one of the first Green Book cottages here in Atlantic City. You go back to the Green Book, it told 
people coming from Pittsburgh or Chicago or New York or Philadelphia, where they can go and have a safe haven to stay at a place that no Jim Crow was involved in. When all the major entertainers would come, whether it was Ella Fitzgerald or even Billie Holiday, they all stayed at the Liberty Hotel. Chicken Bone Beach, located in front of the Boardwalk Hall in Atlantic City. And when the hotel owners of the white hotels up and down the boardwalk, they got complaints that their guests weren't going to come back to Atlantic City anymore because there were black people in their sand and in their water. So they met over at Galloway Township. At that meeting in 1927, they said that we have to move all of the black people off all of the beaches up and down where the hotels are, and we're going to force them to go to a beach called Missouri Avenue Beach. It's been told to me they found chicken bones in the beach. And the cleaners of the beach, who were not African Americans, said, um, we gotta go clean that chicken bone beach. And it stuck to, in a very negative way, in the minds of generations of African Americans. And there was a section called Glamour Row on the beach. When I say Glamour Row, the finest, the most gorgeous honeys you ever saw in your life were sitting in this section. We used to go by and take a little quick peek, <laughs> keep right on walking because uh, they were very well protected. After they came from the beach, they didn't go to the show at night. You can't go to the show with beach hair. And it was a lady who got her start here in Atlantic City. Her name was Madam Sarah Spencer Washington. She started a company called Apex, and Apex was a company that made hair care products. She was interactive with her community, and she did so many great things. She employed people who looked like me. It was just incredible, some 4,000 at one time. It wasn't about her and her business and everything. We had the Easter parade in Atlantic City on the boardwalk, and when we'd have the parade on the boardwalk, African Americans would never win. So Madam Washington decided to have the Easter parade on the north side. That's the kind of person that she was. Our archives today exceed 13,000 pieces. Our warehouses are larger than our museums, and I still buy things today. If there's something that I think that we need for the collection, I will buy it. But it's so very important that we understand the beginnings of these different neighborhoods and how important it is to look back at them today. And that's one thing they can't ever take from me, is my memories.